They do included a declaration saying the treaty is self-executing, so explicitly saying it's self-executing. For seven of the 78, they had a declaration saying it's not self-executing. And in two, for some reason, they didn't include a declaration either way. I'm not sure why. Um, so, uh, so, so the bulk of them, though, they're saying it's self-executing. And, and consistent with Duncan's point, this is all driven by the executive. Basically, the executive said, you ought, to say, you ought to label this one this way, you ought to label this one this way. And the Senate did exactly what the executive recommended. So that's sort of consistent, I think, with your thesis. But the other point to make about these, though, is that if you look at which treaties they said are not self-executing, it's hard to read any of these as actually protecting the states or protecting federalism concerns. What these non-self-executing declarations are doing, the only treaties they apply them to are ones where the federal executive is worried that it's going to be a defendant in a lawsuit brought by a private party. And so this is the federal executive's way of immunizing itself from judicial decisions that hold the federal executive accountable or potentially hold the federal executive accountable for treaty violations. So it's all basically they're looking at which ones may come back to bite us if somebody sues, uh, you know, sues on the basis of this treaty. So it, I don't see a whole lot of this, at least, and this is just, you know, this is one year, a very active year, but one year of what's going on, and they don't seem to be using it for federalism purposes. Um, I guess uh, two other points that, uh, maybe really one other point that I wanted, uh, wanted to make, and this, is a, th this may be a, uh, a point that uh, John and I can debate a little bit, or we may have to do it offline, but he's referring to, uh, d to uh, delegations that have direct effect. I was referring to delegations that are legally binding on the United States as a matter of international law. And I would say the understanding among those who negotiate these treaties is the question whether it is legally binding on the country, whether accepting a binding obligation is a question that is governed by international law and is subject to negotiation among the parties. Whether it has direct effect, and he may be using the term in a slightly different way than I'm understanding it, but whether it has a defect, direct effect is a question of domestic law that is not subject to negotiation among the parties. It is governed by domestic law. That's the way virtually every other country in the world looks at this issue. So the idea that we're going to go out there and negotiate with others about what has direct effect, I think is uh, misunderstanding the line here between domestic and international law. International law says whether it's binding on us. And then how it's applied domestically is a question for the U.S. to decide for itself and is not a subject of negotiation among the parties. That being said, I think John and I actually agree that the critical issue here uh, is when are you going to give an international institution authority to make decisions that are binding on the United States? There's a very limited number of cases where we do that, and there are good reasons why there are a limited number of cases where we do that. Uh, although I think we're going to see more of those coming up in the future, and that's partly why this is important. Uh, Duncan? Sure. Um, I kind of want to build off the, the two previous comments and kind of responding to you, Julie. I think one of the things that, that gets lost in, in this issue is that it's about compliance, right? Is that it, from the international law perspective, when the U.S. enters into these treaties, the question is, what do we need to do to comply? And so a lot of times what happens is the U.S., often the executive branch, looks at this and says, well, you know, we don't need the treaty to have direct domestic effect to comply. So on the human rights treaties, it wasn't that the U.S. joined these treaties and said, well, we want to tell the world, we want to signal the world that we're joining, have a nice signaling effect, but we're not going to have any direct domestic effect. It was that they'd gone through and said, you know, we can comply under existing federal, state, and con constitutional provisions. We don't need this treaty to have direct domestic effect, but th the idea is that there's still compliance. So I think one of the real questions going forward is, and, and this may be your point, is, um, when we're talking about delegation uh, and when we're talking about non-self-execution, there is kind of a background question of what's the effect on choice A or choice B between self-executing and non-self-executing, or between delegating with direct domestic effect or not delegating without direct domestic effect on that question of compliance. Because I think particularly, again, kind of, I guess I've become the, the voice of the executive informally. Um, <laughs> nothing I say should be attributed to my former <laughs> government position, um, you know, all that. But I, I think there's this real question of, uh, I think a lot of it tr is triggered by where where the compliance answer comes out. And so um, I, I think what the response I wanted to make both to, to, to John and David's point was that not only do I think that there's, 
I, I agree with you that there are actually presently very few true international delegations, particularly in the way you've framed it, John. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be asking these questions. But I think what's very interesting is to see how often the United States um, views the correction for an international delegation is to give the U.S. either an opt-in or an opt-out or give the executive branch some voice. So I would say most of the international delegations in there have either a U.S. veto, have a, uh, you know, a, 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 an opt-out where the United States can say, yes, you've adopted that decision, but we're going to back away, um, or some other way in which the United States has ensured that there's, there's an executive branch decision between the international delegation and, um, and domestic effect. Medellin, in some ways, as, as, as um, difficult as some of the other reasoning the court makes, may, it seems consistent with, with that sort uh, of approach. And even on NAFTA, I, I think what's interesting is that if you look, I, I believe the implementing legislation on NAFTA has a severability clause, and what that severability clause says, if any provision, say the binational panels, which, which so bother you, John, are declared unconstitutional, the fallback is the president has the authority to accept, is authorized by Congress to accept a binational panel decision, thereby making it um, federal law. So in, in some ways, I think we, we want to we, we think about this in terms of compliance, and then also, you know, what does it mean to have the executive so constantly thinking the solution to the problem is simply to have an executive voice that can forestall the agreement having direct domestic effect, because that alone hasn't necessarily been satisfactory in the domestic context. I, I can't resist uh, the, that, that last point, if I might just, <laughs> just, just, point, just point, point out that that, that that provision, that fallback severability provision which came out uh, first in the Canadian um, right. uh, free trade agreement uh, was something I thought up on a plane ride. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're in a shuttle from Washington to New York. So I'm very happy to claim it ownership lives, of John, it. It this 20 years le later. Well, uh, that's legislative history. In, future, in uh, future, we will call this the McGinnis Amendment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, uh, let me just, uh, one quick point on what's fascinating though to me, I think the, the reason why I keep coming back to non self execution as the important flashpoint is that. What's fascinating to me is the debates about some of the more controversial treaties. Like I was looking at the CEDAW committee hearings, the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, and one of the chief advocates for it, Senator Barbara Boxer, said <laughs> it's a really important treaty. Um, and it's non-self-executing, so it will require no changes in domestic law. So the opponents of the treaty, uh, their position is not that we don't believe we should eliminate discrimination against women. They believe that it would actually require changes in domestic law. And that's why that was the basis for it. It would get rid of Mother's Day, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so what's weird about it, it seems like a real, uh, it seems like that's, it does seem like it's the, the effect domestically is the flashpoint. And the, the, the non-self-execution declaration is a way to sort of say to the rest of the world we're complying because we are complying, but they're not, but it's also purely to, to claim that we're not actually going to have to change our domestic law. Uh, and there's important domestic political reasons uh, for doing that. And that's why I think it's useful also in the, the context of the delegations. One delegation that has been relatively uncontroversial, I think, maybe despite the protests um, in the streets and stuff like that. Um, the WTO delegations um, are relatively big, um, and I presume John would say technically unconstitutional. Um, because, no, because they're under international law. There, there's, there's no, so because there's no direct effect on it. So it. it seems like the self-execution doctrine would solve our problem here. When the WTO says the U.S. is not in compliance, which they do fairly frequently, um, it, us it almost always requires, where's who's go to? It, goes, it almost always goes to Congress, except in a few cases, or the executive. But in many cases, it goes to Congress and to, to, to come up with compliance. And this isn't actually all that terrible. All the other countries, including Europe, have the same system. They actually have to go back to their legislative processes to, to deal with it. So that seems to me, that actually is both the way that we, many countries could deal with delegations. It is actually considered one of the more successful international systems for uh, cooperation, although there's some controversy on that point. And it seems like that's a strong argument in favor of that system, rather than make going for broke and claiming that we can do direct effect um, as long as we do it through the treaty process.